it's a uh, it's no it's no surprise i think to uh, a lot of folks that tune into this show that tune into various other shows uh, that America has a food insecurity problem, despite being the richest nation uh, in the whole world, or, or 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 the so-called richest nation in the whole world, right? I I don't think America is actually the richest nation. <laughs> I think America has a lot more debt than it does uh, profit <laughs> at the moment, but. Um, we're looking at massive, massive food insecurity in uh, in America. Um, and a lot of this has to do with uh, the supply chain and distribution, which uh, these issues have existed well beyond the pandemic. Um, I've covered a video about them. I did a video about them a couple of years ago about uh, about organic food, why organic food costs so much. Um, and food waste specifically. Those are two big. Pe- I, I, I have a little pet peeve. Um, where I don't like wasting food, like it bugs me when you go to a restaurant and you order something and you go, boy, I can't finish this. And the waiter comes over and says, Hey, would you like me to box that up? And you go, nah, just throw it away. It bugs me. It it really does. I'm like, you can take that home or you can cut off an edge of it and be like, would you like to eat it? Minimum wage worker. (laughs) that probably can't afford the food at the restaurant that you're working at because the restaurant you're working at doesn't pay you enough to eat at the restaurant, which I think is a fucking travesty. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, I, I think if you, I think if you're, um, uh, if you're a restaurant, your employee should be able to afford what you eat at the restaurant. So if you're this fucking, you know, high priced, fancy, pansy fucking French restaurant, uh, then, and your, and your, uh, appetizers are like eight, 12, $15 or something. You better be paying your employees enough, um, that they can eat the food at that restaurant. I know crazy. What a crazy, what a crazy thing to say. Uh, what a radically insane thing to say, Chris. People should be able to afford food at the place that they work at if they're working at a food serving place. That's you're a you're a a, a, a a Looney Tune person. That's where you are. But no, I, you know, I, I always get bugged up uh, when I, I I used to deal with this in college and have to fucking bite my tongue all the time when people would be like, "Nah, you can just." take it away and i'm like that's fun. that's like a meal you just you have another meal that you can eat um but you know we live in a highly wasteful society uh before the pandemic there were 35 million people that were food insecure um you know that either couldn't afford food period and had to be on some kind of assistance programs um or they just can't afford a lot of food. And I've been in that position when I first started touring around the country. Uh, boy, howdy, was I eating a lot of peanut butter Sammies. Uh, peanut butter on both sides. Jelly's expensive. Jelly's expensive sometimes. <laughs> and uh, and every so often I would get like pasta. Um, you know, I, I, I would be lucky to get some extra vegetables. Usually some onions and peppers is all I could really afford. Um, so if it wasn't peanut butter Sammies, it was eating some pasta you know, basic, uh, put some vegetables in there, throw some sauce on top of it, eat that up canned foods. That's, I would eat a lot of canned foods, soups, uh, chili. I still do that now. Like I still have, uh, that, that mentality exists in my head where I'm like, Oh, I got to get more canned food so I can eat <laughs> cheap fucking canned food. Uh, cause you know, I don't know when it's going to go back to that time, but you know, uh, every so often I would get, I would get like a good, decent meal. Uh, and that would be, um, that would be out of the generosity of strangers out of the people that I would say, well, I used to service called couch surfing all the time. And, uh, and the, and like, they would be generous enough to open up their homes, provide me with a couch to stay on and, uh, and also cook me a meal every so often. So I was very lucky in that term, but you know, when I was on the road, it, I, I, I remember one night coming off the road and I'd eaten most of the food that I had taken on the road with me because I, you know, uh, divvied it up properly, rationed it out properly. 
And when I got home, I didn't, I didn't know what to eat. And I was hungry one night and I was having a panic attack and I couldn't go to sleep. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll eat something and I'll, and it'll like help me go to sleep. And the only thing I could eat was a, uh, I made a wrap with cucumbers, pickles, uh, a slice of onion and some, uh, honey mustard. And that's what I ate. Uh, and that's really all I had to eat for like two days. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've been there. I've been at a point where it was like, do I buy food or do I have enough money to make rent this month? Um, and, and 35 million Americans before the pandemic were in that position. Right. Uh, and in the richest country in the world, it's a little ridiculous that we had that kind of a condition, especially when we're also a country where, I mean, we can solve that problem like that. I didn't snap properly. Slap that into the mic. <laughs> now, uh, post-pandemic, we're up to 50 million people that are food insecure. And again, this this can be solved. This can be taken care of, right? Like, this can be fixed very quickly. Um, and the problem is that it's not because 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 the corporations don't want it to. And, I'll, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, is 40% of food goes to waste. 40% of food is, is just wasted. And this is, this is from the top to the bottom, right? This is from, uh, from, from the production, the transport, the grocers to the consumers itself. Throughout all of that, 40% of food goes to waste. Uh, that's an incredibly high number when you have 50 million people that are food insecure in this country that right there could 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 end food insecurity oh man uh you know i bought uh two pounds of apples this week and i only need half a pound great go and donate that those apples to something simple problem solved right there that should be encouraged all the time. There should be places in every community where you can go and donate food and you should be encouraged to. It should be easy to do. You know, in the, in the pandemic times, there should be, you know, plexiglass masks, all that, all that sort of business. This, this is one of those things where they don't talk about the labor movement is the labor movement actually took care of this sort of stuff. They knew people were going to be hungry if they went on strike, so they organized food kitchens. You know, like if um, that was one of the, you know, back this is back in the ye old days, uh, early 1900s and late 1800s, where you know women weren't working, so they would they would be like, "Cool, men are on strike. We're going to get the food together." Far and then farmers would donate. That happened a lot too. Farmers would just donate food to these kitchens. And they would feed the striking workers. They would feed people. So why does this sort of stuff happen, right? There's corporate consolidation. Today, there's corporate consolidation. That's part of the problem um, that's, uh, that's going on now. And how this works is, it's basically the, the corporate cons consolidation of food, which is like larger corporations buy out and basically prevent any sort of local community-based um, uh, feeding programs from really taking root. And I'm talking about like local grocers that work with uh, local small business farmers. They don't work with big agriculture, you know. But that's again, but big ag works with companies like Walmart and uh, and and food processors like Nestle and Clorox. Did you guys know Clorox was a food processor? I interned at a place where I found out that uh, like two thirds of what's in your grocery store is actually made by Clorox. And the reason why they don't put their, their they put a subsidiary logo on there, right? They, the Clorox is the parent company. They have a subsidiary company and a production company that makes a bunch of different shit. And that's the brand name that's on there. It's like three levels deep so that people don't associate, you know, buying a, a bag of chips with cleaning products because that's gross and unsafe, right? So it's like, oh, you're a cleaning, you're a company that sells cleaning products, but also making chips. That's kind of fucking weird. Why are you doing that? But it's but it's because they're consolidating it and they want to basically be 
at a point where you know if if something is dangerous with their cleaning products or something is dangerous with their chips or their soups or ice creams or whatever they don't lose a shit ton of money as a parent company like that's why it's that's why they are cool with settling lawsuits or taking a a million dollar fine um and then just being like our bad we'll switch out this product and it's you know like a month's worth of labor or whatever which who, they're not really paying those laborers a whole lot anyway so it becomes um it becomes like not a big deal for them to lose a million dollars and a month worth of labor to fix this issue because they have 18, 19 other fucking products that they can use because that's under their parent company label. Right. Uh, so Nestle does this Clorox does this. Um, and then all the seeds uh, down to the big ag, uh, end of things are owned by surprise, surprise companies like Bayer Monsanto. Right. So even the agricultural end of things is, is owned by big corporations that are that are essentially consolidating. They're creating monopolies. So corporate consolidation becomes a little buzzword for for monopolization. Right. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the, the thing that's going on here. So, so the way this works is and I kind of described it a little bit already. Is you have the parent company that owns like a packing plant or a factory uh, that makes, you know, let's just say nuts they they make mixed nuts that's one of the things that they do uh and what they'll do is that they'll make these same products for various different brands so like uh, a, a a a container of nuts that's like basic brand name right like let's say it's the walgreens brand of nuts and it's three dollars for the can but then you see this cool like emerald elegance nut company probably packed by the same company. They probably have the same parent company. It's just they made one thing. This is, I mean, this is like label psychology. This was shit that I learned in graphic design when I when I went to school for design. Um, you know, these companies use the labels and the way they market it to essentially say, well, these nuts are going to be charged at um, at $6 a, a, a bag and these nuts are going to be charged $2 a bag. And regardless of what they're charging, the the parent company is still making a shit ton of money because really what it cost to you know put these things together was about 35 cents and really what you're buying is a logo and a label because the nuts were packed in the same fucking plant they're just put in different boxes they're they're, they're put in different pretty things that's really what it boils down to and then you have the grocers and the re retailers that also have to make a margin. So so that's why they charge so much more for it. And these retailers can charge more for all this shit because they're like, oh, well, this is a high quality nuts. This is the low quality nuts, but we're still making money on the back end of it. And look, this is not me saying like, oh, these grocers shouldn't make any money off of it. So they're charging, you know, I, I understand that they have to recoup their costs, pay their employees and keep the lights on in the building. So I get that. 35 a, a, a bag of nuts that costs 35 cents realistically at the grocery store becomes two dollars that's fine and they're making some money but then the same the same nuts the same bag of nuts is charged six dollars and really who's winning out are the big corporate fucking retailers like walmart and companies like nestle who are in that nut game which I understand sounds like a sexual innuendo. It's not. Uh, not, not in this case. Uh, but they also control the supply on the farm side of things too, right? Because they're the ones determining how much these farms can make and what the quality of the product is. Do you guys know how much in ugly fruits gets thrown out every single fucking year? Like it's insane the amount of fucking. They're just like, oh, this fruit, this fruit looks a little oblong. People aren't gonna want. Again, you're you're not even buying it for the nutritional value. Our 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 culture is so warped in terms of food, thanks to capitalism, thanks to things like corporate consolidation, that we look at a piece of fruit and we go, oh, it's weird looking. Probably it's like, no, it tastes the same. 
we get a little box thing of uh, imperfect fruits all the time. It's like fruits that are a little too big, a little too wonky looking. Oh, the, the, the potatoes don't look the right color and they get thrown away. But instead, now there are companies that are like, we'll buy them and then we'll sell them to fucking people that want them. We'll partner with farmers so they don't lose a shit ton of what they, you know, so these local farmers don't don't lose money in in the shit that they farmed. Because things don't look pretty enough. We're buying things for the aesthetics of things, not for the actual content of it, right? It's even down to our food. We have this vapid outlook on society. That's how sad capitalism has made us. So now, because they control everything, even down to the farm end, right? Down to the agricultural end. Uh, what do they do in a situation like this where where we have, um, you know, restaurants and retailers and grocers not purchasing as much because people can't afford that much, right? So what happens to the farmers? Well, the, the parent company that controls the supply in the farm that has partnered with things like Bayer Monsanto will tell them to say, okay, grow all that stuff because we need you to do the work because we're obsessed with the, the need for labor. Uh, but then throw it all away because that's cheaper for us. We still pay you and all that. Now we don't have to pay the distribution costs, right? They don't have to pay the driver. They don't have to worry about gas. They don't have to pay the retailer. They don't have to pay the restaurants. They don't have to worry about any of that kind of shit. So it's cheaper for this parent company to say, grow all the food, collect all the dairy, you know, feed all the livestock, take care of them. And then just throw it all away and, and, and murder the fucking livestock. And that's what they've done. They murdered a bunch of livestock. This is this is capitalism for you guys, right? This is the nonsense. This I mean, this is why you look at you look at uh, a country like America, which which continues to claim to be the greatest country on the f face of the earth, the richest country on the face of the earth, and you have 30, 50 million people food insecure. Because companies are like, oh, it's more uh, profitable for us to just throw and waste all the food away. And the farmers are looking at this going, man, we put our heart and soul into making this shit work. And y'all just want us to throw it like this is uh, fucking terrible. What they should do is take the fucking hit considering how much money they're making on selling a fucking brand, a logo, a color scheme, a type, a, 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 a font, and for years they've been doing this, becoming fucking billionaires. And you should say, you know what? Take the fucking hit. But you shouldn't be legally allowed to throw away food. You should pay to donate that to, to you know, Food Not Bombs, Feeding America, uh, whatever other soup kitchens, what have you. We did the thing in, in Millvale where uh, there was a farm that had just had excess stuff. And they were like, we'll box it up. Send it out in a truck and you guys distribute it amongst your community to people that need it. Fucking saved our ass. So now what they're really creating by throwing all this stuff away is disruptions in the food chain. Right? So the grocers, like, think about it. If restaurants aren't buying milk and produce and so on and so forth, it's a percentage of you know, percentage of product that's not going to the place that it was intended to go to. So they're throwing it away. Instead, they could also sell it to grocery stores. Grocery stores need to stock up on this stuff because that's what people are going out and trying to buy. Dude, we had a winter weather advisory and people were probably going nuts. You don't think grocery stores could use the extra fucking supplies? There was like a shortage on things. They were just like, hey, Lemon, how much you're buying? Because we don't know what these corporations are going to do. Like stores like Aldi, Trader Joe's, they were just like, we don't know. Ooh, you could you could immediately stop that limit. I mean, you have to the the limits were particularly put into place also because human beings are panic prone and will fucking go and hoard everything that they need to. But this now this now lets the grocers say, well, you know, there's a disruption in the supply chain, 
And now that $2 bag of nuts, because we don't know when we're getting our nuts anymore, is now $4 for the cheapo kind. And for the deluxe kind, it's $10. And we get to do that because, well, disruptions is a supply chain, which has been manufactured because instead of wasting all that food, you could not only donate it to, to food kitchens that fucking need it, but you could also give it to grocers who would, who would happily purchase it so that they don't have customers screaming at their employees. But they don't give a shit about that. During the pandemic, prices of food have gone up by 3.4%. Uh, and unemployment is going even higher. So they're jacking up the prices while people are out of work so they can't afford the food that they need to stay alive and do the work that these corporations require them to do. Th this is this is like the snake eating itself. None of none of this makes any fucking sense, right? They're manufacturing food insecurity, controlling the supply chain, disrupting it on purpose even though there's a solution right in front of them. And then they're like, oh, jack up the prices so that people that need to actually eat can't eat. And where's the government on this? Nowhere. They're like, oh, well, these, you know, fucking food shelters will take care of it. It's food kitchens. They got it. No, no, no. You're a government. Whenever this sort of shit happens, it is your responsibility as a fucking government to, to actually feed people. That's like a, that's like one of the roles of the government. There's an issue with meat packing plants. There's various issues with meat packing plants, but where, where um, there's a demand that is uh, that they can't meet. Pardon the pun. But these meat packing plants have a, a much larger demand than they can meet. And while they're doing that, they're still exporting their meat to different countries, right? Uh, and while they're exporting meat to different countries, uh, because they didn't shut down, because these meat companies like Cargill and Tyson aren't taking safety protocols into account, um, a bunch of their employees are catching COVID, and they still have to come to work because they don't have paid leave. They don't get paid sick leave. They don't get health insurance. They're paid like garbage. They can't afford any of this shit. So they just come to work sick and they spread shit around. Now think about this. this is basic food chain shit. If you have a sick employee that don't have PPEs that are that's sick, that work in a meat packing plant, if they contract a disease, they can pass it on through the meat because it's organic stuff. And then everybody down the line can get sick. Like, this is a health code and human rights violation. And these companies are like, their, their, their uh, response to exporting meat to other countries is, well, it's not meat that Americans want to eat anyway. Really? Did you take a poll? Did you take a poll of what America, because I bet you, I bet you the 50 million people that can't afford food right now would happily fucking get, you know, whatever you think is not acceptable by him again it's this it's this vain vapid aesthetics bullshit instead of just being like this is something that people need to eat to survive and yeah they're gonna grill it yeah they're gonna season it and that's okay too if you're poor because you who says that only the rich are allowed to fucking have flavor in their fucking food So what are the solutions to this, right? I know we've been we've been talking about how uh, corporate consolidation and the corporate control of food uh, on various different levels has caused a lot of issues. Well, one thing you could do is uh, is start implementing rotational farming. Uh, you could also do vertical farming. Vertical farming would actually save a lot of space. It would um, help a lot of people. Now you can't grow certain like root crops can't be grown through vertical farming. That's just too difficult. Um, so you need the ground for that. Yeah. Uh, so you do rotational farming. Rotational farming is, is I think I believe this guy named Robert Rodale came up with this idea. Uh, I remember reading about it in truth out and uh, rotational farming is basically you, you, you plant specific things per season. So, you know, yeah, that means that, and, and really there's a big solution to this by, 
by America being as large as it is. But if a farm in Iowa decides that, okay, from, and look, I'm not a farmer. So if I get the specifics wrong, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to kind of work on the ideas and give providing some examples so people can understand it. So forgive me if, if I say like a plant grows in a particular month and some people in the comment section are like, you don't know shit about farming. I don't. I'm just I'm going off of what I've read and what I think is a good idea. The concept seems like this is a good idea. Um, so let's say this this farmer in Iowa decides corn will be grown from uh, March through May. And then, you know, we'll we'll harvest all of it. We'll put it on a truck. We'll sell it to some grocery stores and bing, bang, boom. Now we have to grow something different. Let's grow some eggplant. Right. Let's grow some uh, let's grow some cilantro. Let's grow some herbs. Uh, maybe we'll grow some wheat. Over the summertime, we'll grow a couple different crops. And then when it starts getting a little bit colder, it's like, okay, well, let's, you know, put this stuff away. Uh, uh, we'll, but now the the earth is not going to die out. Um, it's not going to be littered with pesticides. It's not going to get the same, you know, basic nutrition all the time. It's going to be teeming with various different kinds of bacteria, insects that all help the fertilization of plants, that all help soil health. Uh, and that's the idea behind rotational farming. Now, obviously, in a country that big, everybody's going, oh, so I guess we're going to get corn from fucking March to, to May, you fucking communist pinko piece of shit. No. Do you know how many fucking farms are across the country? I've driven across this country. A lot of this country is farmland. A lot of this country is just growing corn for a specific period of time already. What if different farms grew different shit at different times of the year? So now you do have diversity in crops. You do have diversity in what we're eating. And then they rotate that shit around. So you don't lose certain crops, certain produce at certain times of the year. And even if you do, I mean, there are certain plants that don't grow in certain times of the year. That's fine. Guess what? It's called patience. When I was growing up in India, we couldn't get certain fruits in certain times of the year because they j it just wasn't the season. And you know what I did? I didn't fucking bitch about it. My mom would buy me those fruits. It would be a fun treat for me to have. And, and then I would wait for the next season for, for me to enjoy that fruit again. And that's completely fine. So vertical farming, rotational farming, those are things you can do on the agricultural level. Again, this could be implemented tomorrow. You could you could build out a plan for this in in a it, very quickly, right? Well, we also need a solidarity between uh, small grocers, right, mom and pop grocers, uh, even companies like like Trader Joe's, which talks about fair trade ethical. Uh, growing farming and transportation and things of that sort. And I know Trader Joe's has issues, but I mean, they're not a, uh, they're not a Walmart, you know, even companies like Kroger or Giant Eagle. And if you live in the, uh, if you live in the Western Pennsylvania region, uh, into the Ohio, West Virginia region, right? Like you guys know what Kroger's and Giant Eagles are. They could take part in this and stand in solidarity with the farmers, small business farmers. Stand in solidarity with local farmers, local transport companies, and consumers. Offer them a decent price that isn't gouging it, that isn't, you know, corporately consolidating food. Offer a variety of different things from a variety of different places. What really can stop this corporate consolidation is if if more grocers and consumers and transport companies and farmers and all that adopt the community co-op model, adopt the farmer's market model so you know where your food's coming from. You can trust it. Because in a community co-op model, the customers are owners of the store. They have a say. So if we find out that there's a product that is unethical or fucking terrible for people, then the customers can say, we no longer want that in our store. And if you put that in your store, we're not going to buy there. And if you continue to put that from that store, we'll go find a different place to shop. And it says, okay, cool. 
as a private business owner, I understand the concerns of my customer and I'm going to look for an alternative to whatever product this is because this prob product is problematic. Simple. The focus should be on on waste reduction and uh, what did I write here? Uh, food donation. If you want less people to go food insecure, there should be an easy place for you to go and donate your food. There should be a very easy way for you to be able to to give food to certain people, and it shouldn't be illegal. There are states that make feeding homeless people illegal. That's crazy to me. That's so callous. That goes against what the, you know, like. We're, oh, we're a country of empathy. Are you? Because I'm pretty sure if you're living under a fucking bridge and I give them a piece of bread, I'm going to prison for it. And so is that person living under the bridge. That's not an empathetic society. So it should be more on uh, community co-op, you know, sustainability in terms of the agriculture uh, and, and easy food distribution, less waste and less more donations more mutual aid in terms of food. All right, let me look at a couple of comments. Oh, Mona. Hello, Mona. Good to see you. Working with working with the kiddos. Uh, I, I hope you're doing okay. If you catch this a little later, uh, it's always good to see you. Uh, Holly says, I was raised to clean my plate. Uh, yes, I, I agree. She takes food, oh, food extra. Yeah, I don't. I, I try to do my best to kind of doggy bag it and, and eat it later. Um, most of the cheap foods are, are are fatty foods like chips. Yep, that's exactly true. Uh, that's why when you know places that get hit harder um, by companies like Walmart and stuff are low income, black and Latino neighborhoods, and their local bodegas can't get the good food because they're being blocked by this supply chain that Walmart has taken over, that these giant corporate titans have taken over. And so they are left with the garbage food, and that's what the people in the neighborhood can afford, right? My buddy has a a, a great joke about um, about how he knows that the the community is ch changing when uh, uh, when a Whole Foods show up. So uh, you know that's that's the same thing. Uh, we need to bring soup kitchens, like the depression soup, soup kitchens during the depression. Yeah, that's what we need. A whole lot of. Uh, did you see the line of cars in Dallas waiting for food? I have, yes. Uh, it was a shocker because NBC News actually covered it. And I was like astounded that they're covering this food insecurity issue. Uh, but what they don't do is talk about uh, why it's being caused and how it's being caused and what we can do to solve it. And they don't, they, I mean, this is, this is not, the corporate journalists don't do any of that stuff because they're, you know, they're like, oh, look how sad this is. Oh. Republicans, you know, like that's what the Democratic side does. And it, it, but they don't talk about, yeah, this is corporate consolidation. And guess what? Both sides have fucking approved this sort of shit. Um, Blue Diamond Nuts, that's the one that I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's price gouging for food. And it is it is um, a, a result of, of privatization. Um, you know, I think I think there should be some regulation in terms of what corporations can do with food and how much they can charge and this, that, and the third. This will lead into the next topic of discussion that we have uh, on on our on our show today. Um, over on Rockfin, we got Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Sarah says, absolutely, the solutions to food insecurity are the same solutions to access to healthcare and economic uh, security. Trust equals accountability. 100%. Absolutely. Uh, you, you absolutely need to have trust in order to have accountability. Uh, because at least then you know if, if somebody is going to be accountable, you can trust them. And the person that is going to take accountability for their mistakes is going to know that, you know, we're not going to treat them like absolute garbage. And that's not the point of it. That's that's the thing that corporations are really afraid of is if they take accountability for it, uh oh, there might be some legal something or the other that might come down the pipeline. So we phrase it in a way where we're it sounds like we're taking accountability, but in reality we're not. Um and and you can't trust a company that that does that sort of stuff. You can't trust a company that that makes billions of dollars 
Um, and then most of its employees are on food stamps. Uh, and the CEO of the company calls for a food drive to help feed their customers. Once again, going back to what I started with, if you work for a company, you should be able to afford their products. And if you can't, that company is fucked and should not be supported. Walmart, Amazon, Nestle, all of these companies fall, fall into that category. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do... Uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.